Hello, my name is Mr. Daniel from Manor Academy and today I'm going to be talking about the influence of Agatha Christie and detective fiction in general on J.B. Priestley's and Inspector Calls. The detective novel began in around the middle of the 1800s with the American writer Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, he had a short story called The Murders in the Rue Morgue and that featured a fictional detective, um, a French detective called C. Auguste Dupin. And he appeared in two more short stories later on and became very, very popular. And Poe invented many of the sort of the, the tropes and stereotypes and conventions that we, we sort of find in a lot and lots of detective fiction now, which we'll talk about uh, in a little while. And Poe's stories inspired Arthur Conan Doyle in England to create probably the most famous fictional detective of all time, Sherlock Holmes, one of the most adapted characters in all of um, literature and stage and screen as well. This in turn inspired the one of the sort of the people we're focused on today, Agatha Christie, and she invented the very, very popular characters of Poirot and Miss Marple, and she became the, the sort of biggest selling novelist of all time. And Priestley in the 40s saw that there was a huge um, public interest for the, the detective novel. He, he dabbled in novels himself. He'd started working in the theater and realized that he could use this model to, to tell his sort of socialist story. So by the time we get to Christie, um, who was a very prolific author, she is a, borrowed a little bit from Poe, borrowed quite heavily from Conan Doyle, and establishes lots and lots of conventions and tropes within her own work, um, many of which Priestley borrows from in Inspector Calls. So we start off with a, a brief introduction of the characters and the setting, and then we get the, the shocking crime. So the, 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 the crime is sort of supposed to um, be quite, quite an arresting thing. It's supposed to shock the audience, and it's, it's a moment where um, we're all very invested in it, very interested in it, and generally speaking, pretty much everyone can be a suspect. The setting... And lots of Christie's novels, they take place in sort of stately homes, country manors, quite expensive places. If they do take place um, outside of the home, they're in sort of exotic locales and, and destinations, but generally lots of money uh, is involved. There is a mixing of the classes, so you'll get sort of the lord of the manor or ladies or in Christie, famous film stars, actors, singers, opera singers, things like that, um, being suspects. But as well as that, you'll equally, you'll get the servants as well, um, who potentially could have motives to be the killers, which Priestley takes a little bit of. You can argue the character of Edna um, sort of represents the, the lower classes there, never really a suspect, um, never really involved, but she's there. The another interesting thing is that the the investigator, the sort of the detective, um, generally not uh, not employed by the police directly. They're sort of potentially um, self-taught, or they've they've honed their skills from other particular areas, um, and they can employ sort of different methods. Um, and the police sometimes rub up against the police, and the police. Uh, potentially seen as sort of bumbling fools who potentially get in their way. And another important thing is that they, they don't have the potentially corruptive influence of the, of the police, um, which is something obviously Priestley deals with quite a lot. He, he goes out of his way to, to mention that he, he doesn't sort of um, play golf with uh, the upper echelons and the police force. Uh, another one is that the, the investigator, the detective, the inspector, whatever, whoever it might be, has this almost sort of supernatural ability to, to pick up clues and seems to know a huge amount uh, about the people involved and about the case before the case has even begun, really. And that goes all the way back to Paul and Dupin. Um, and obviously carries through the inspector. He seems to know everything. 
and the the one we're going to talk about this later on is usually in in this fiction there is a definite resolution we we catch the killer we know who's done it the guilty party and uh, they are sort of found out and obviously Priestley issues that convention for a very particular reason which i'll discuss later on the next thing we're going to talk about is a thing called the MacGuffin. And I'm going to caveat this part by saying you may not actually use this word in an essay, and I'm not saying that Priestley was even aware of this term, but uh, it's sort of something that's come around as a term in, in all fiction, really, to explain an object which uh, drives the plot and bring people, brings people together. So I'm going to talk about um, its relevance to Eva on the next slide, but just a little bit of background on what MacGuffin is and where the term came from and why it might be important. So the MacGuffin originally comes around um, after Alfred Hitchcock, the great British filmmaker, released a film called The 39 Steps, and which is basically you have um, these two characters who were drawn together and sort of they're being chased by this spy ring. And the film is called The 39 Steps. And in the final scenes of the movie, you have this guy called Mr. Memory, whose sort of professional talent is he can memorize enormous amounts of information and he's about to tell the audience what the 39 steps are and he literally spoiler alert he gets shot before he gets a chance to tell us what the 39 steps are and hitchcock used the MacGuffin um many times to sort of objects that can drive a plot things people are sort of chasing things people are talking about the sort of centerpiece of a film but ultimately hitchcock would argue that the the thing itself is unimportant um a couple of other famous examples the 1941 um film the, the maltese falcon again you've got its pro private detective and you've got lots of people chasing this this thing called the maltese falcon which they believe is sort of a this solid gold falcon and then the, the top layer is just a fake when actually at the end of the film it turns out that it, it's not it's actually just it's worthless and another one another very famous example of citizen kane the film starts with the the title character charles foster kane he's on his deathbed he drops this snow globe and his final word is rosebud and the whole film we're wondering what this rosebud is and why it's so important and it turns out to be just a, um, a sled that he used to go and play on in the snow when he was a kid and ultimately the object itself is of very very little importance uh, you could argue but it brings everyone around it george lucas who went on to make star wars and the indiana jones films he has a different take and he thinks that actually we should care about the macguffin and the object and the other person or whatever that brings everyone together in the plot as much as we should care about the heroes and the villains which brings me on to an inspector calls so eva as MacGuffin. you will potentially get questions about eva as a character and the importance of eva and you have to decide yourself sort of to what level you discuss her as a character in her own right or as a, a symbol or a tool simply to reflect the the attitudes um of the other characters and we'll talk we're going to talk about the inspector in a similar way um later on so i'm positive in the theory that eva herself potentially could be a MacGuffin because she's talked about all the way through but never actually seen um as in some of the MacGuffins that we've mentioned before uh, of course she can be cast as an actress in some film versions uh where they cast the same actress but i would argue that takes something of the the mystery away potentially um she has a connection to every single character the, the the driving narrative force of the play is everybody has to speak about their interaction with this character that we never meet during that you could argue that the characters themselves how honest they are is entirely questionable a technique that christy uses a lot we'll see interviews with characters and then we'll see different versions of that and other characters will talk about that and it will won't quite add up what they've said is being entirely honest um so we get sort of eric not understanding her as a person doesn't really understand why she's there at the palace bar in the first place um, and sort of excusing what he did through alcohol we've got gerald very much selling himself as the the hero the rescuer which um sheila certainly 
it doesn't swallow and it comes to, it comes at it with that very sarcastic, quite caustic comment, oh, you must have loved it. You're the wonderful fairy prince. Um, so how honest people are being about her, we're not quite sure. Of course, she could be several different women. After Gerald's revelation that pretend, no one potentially has died or they could all, have, they could all be different women. Um, and again, you'd have to consider the dramatic impact of that. Is it, does it even matter if she's several different women whatsoever? I would argue not. She's a symbol. She represents the downtrodden. She represents how women are oppressed, the lower class are oppressed, how, how the young, younger generation are oppressed. And because she's symbolic and we never see her, she carries that aura of mystique like a MacGuffin does. And finally is the fact that she is perfect. She's sort of this unattainable person. If she is a real human being, she has this unattainable, perfect quality about her. She seems to hold no grudge whatsoever when Gerald breaks off their affair. And she seems entirely altruistic towards Eric uh, when she sort of lets him quite easily out of the, the marriage that he has begrudgingly proposed. And she doesn't want him stealing any more money. She probably doesn't want him being kicked out of his parents' will. So you'd have to ask yourself, would it, does, does a person like that exist who makes perfect moral choices all the time? Or is she more of this figurehead that Priestley uses to show that actually the lower class are not what Mrs. Burning thinks. They, they can make moral choices, good moral choices. A uh, red herring is um, usually a, a prop or uh, an item or a snippet of conversation or it could even be a character that is discussed that the writer uses to make the audience think is really, really important and sort of vital to the outcome of the, the story. And when it's all said and done, it turns out to have been a bit of a ruse, which was designed pretty much to distract us from the, the important truth, so the, the important details. And Agatha Christie used red herrings in all of her novels. She was a master at it. Um, and if you ever read one of her books or watch a film adaptation of them, you'll, you'll find yourself sort of thinking that certain things are hugely significant when they're not, and that's all by design. Things like monogrammed handkerchiefs or um, there's a kimono in Murder on the Orient Express or a button from that somebody's missing from a piece of their clothing that has been found at the murder scene, um, smoking guns, all sorts of clues that we think were important and they, they're designed to make us not linger on the other things that we just sort of take and as given and we're distracted by. Um, and the point of a red herring is, or the purpose of a red herring is when the, the truth, the final actual truth is revealed, it has more impact because we have been focused and distracted on these other, these other things that were actually quite trivial in the first place. Why am I talking about red herrings, you may ask? Well, again, I'm going to posit the theory that actually Ghoul himself is a, a bit of a red herring and the entire investigative process is a bit of a red herring, okay? So, reasons for this. Well, firstly, in the, the sort of description, when he arrives, he's described as someone of um, massiveness, purposefulness and solidity. So immediately we, we think this guy is super, super important and he sort of commands the stage. He's very straight talking, he's no nonsense, straight to the point, and he wants to get on with the investigation with very little sort of preamble. So we, we, we like him and we follow him instantly, he commands the stage. He uses the sort of the props, like the, the photograph to, um, again, distract our attention away from the fact that actually but come the end of the play, we know that he knew everything sort of before he went in. And we genuinely believe that he sort of acts in this way. He has, he has lots of the protocols that an inspector might actually use. And it distracts us from the fact that he, he isn't an inspector, of course. He has no connection to the police, which is something I've mentioned earlier. But we don't question it because he carries this enormous authority. We don't question it at the time that he has absolutely no connection whatsoever to any other member of the police force. We just, the, the, the characters believe it, the, it's written and performed in that way that it's just solved like that and we, we don't question it. 
Um, another reason is that it's a, it's a morality play. It's not actually a play where people are found out to have broken the law uh, in many ways. Um, and it, there's never any real potential for any sort of criminal prosecution whatsoever. Um, you could argue, obviously, it's never mentioned, but what Eric does to her, the sort of the sexual assault, um, it's never, it's never sort of, it's only ever referred to in euphemism. Um, and you could argue Eric has broken the law there, but when the play was written, the chance of a prosecution or conviction of that would be pitifully small. And even now, sadly, if you run at the mention of modern day sort of um, take on it, still, sadly, very, very small. Of course, there's the money stealing thing as well. Um, and that, that's pretty much swept over very quickly. Um, we are led to believe that his unmasking is of huge significance at the end. They, Eric and Burling are very, very excited um, and it's a shock to the audience that this guy isn't real. The characters celebrate, the tension drops, they have their drinks, so we get that circular narrative right back to the start. But of course, once the second phone call comes around, all of that's gone because it was never about the fact that he was a real inspector. The, the whole point of the play is that they're supposed to confront what they've done. They're supposed to start taking some responsibility. And as Eric and Sheila pick up, it didn't matter whatsoever whether the inspector was real at all. It was never about a culprit being caught. And the most masterful stroke that Priestley pulls in the whole thing, which I'm sure he was very proud of and Christy would have been very proud of, is we almost forget that we know right from the very start of the play that Eva has killed herself. There is nobody to blame. We get so caught up in this chain of events that Gould tells us about that we forget almost that there is nobody to blame, that she did kill herself. Um, well, the nobody to blame part will come on to uh, very, very shortly. So speaking of blame, we can now talk a little bit about motive and method. So obviously Christy in all of, pretty much all of her um, detective fiction, there is a killer, there is motive and there is method. And as you can see there, the usual, the usual motives are things like jealousy of uh, someone in sort of similar, similar job to you, spurned lovers, the age old greed, hatred, just general revenge, all very human um, sort of emotions, but taken to extreme lengths by someone who actually commits that level of violence to kill someone. Um, interestingly, um, over half of her novels have poison as the murder weapon. Um, and the, the lot, some of them, it's a sort of spur of the moment thing, but lots of them, it's very carefully planned and concocted by one or sometimes two or three or even more people between them where they've got this this plan where they're going to kill someone and they are going to try and get away with it. The thing which connects all of them is they do actually intend to kill. So Priestley took this idea and had a little bit more of a complex take on it and what the inspector would describe as this chain of events, okay? Because we know, of course, that none of our characters actually intended to kill Eva. She killed herself, but we get caught up in this drama of it uh, until the final moment of the play, which we're going to discuss now. So in the final moments of the vast majority of Christie's novels, we get this um, denouement where it's the, the sort of the satisfactory ending of the play where all of the, all of the previous things we've seen before, all the clues and the suspects and everyone, they all are very, very neatly and satisfactorily tied up in little balls and we find out um, what actually happened. And this sort of style of ending a detective um, piece of fiction has stood the test of time and it's been imitated by pretty much everyone since most recently and very, very well by Ryan Johnson's um, Knives Out series of films, which he's going to continue, which very much follows the, the Christie um, formula. So what happens in the denouement of a Christie novel is the suspects are all gathered in one room or one place. 
the inspector goes through all the evidence again to each of the characters and it's sort of a refresher and a, and a reminder to the audience of all the clues that they've been given all of the red herrings and the MacGuffins, uh, which ones were real and important and which ones uh, sort of were insignificant and there's that moment of uh, sort of satisfaction for the audience of thinking did they guess right um were, were they right or did, did they did they know that something was unimportant or not and the killer is named and ultimately the motiv the motivation is explained by the inspector or by the detective um they say you kill this person with this weapon because of this and then they face justice okay and it's, like i said it's a trial and tested method and ultimately at the end for the audience we get this moment of sort of catharsis where we breathe a sigh of relief we think aha right justice has been done and we have that we can detach from the story then we can detach ourselves from the guilty person by allowing to, allowing ourselves to tell ourselves that i would never do that even though i might feel jealousy or rage or whatever it would never be so bad that i would go and kill someone and that person that fictional character did it i'm better than them uh, i'm a normal person and i can go about my everyday life and we, we're, we are allowed that by the end of those and we get that enjoyment um potentially even a little bit of schadenfreude of the fact that they are going to go to jail they're going to suffer for the terrible thing that they did whereas Priestley takes the idea of that takes a lot of the structural ideas of that but then subverts it entirely which we're going to discuss in the last slide next so Priestley's the new one in and inspector calls uh follows the pattern like i said but then shifts enormously so the suspects are all gathered together he does indeed go through all of the evidence and some of the clues and things that they've said um but where usually the killer is named and the motiv motivation given of course there is no killer like i said earlier we've followed this drama all the way through forgetting the fact of course that eva did kill herself okay and i, and I sort of mentioned earlier there is no one to blame well of course that isn't true there indeed is lots of people to blame and all of the burlings are the blame and all of society is the blame um and the motivation is very very different so where you can very easily put your finger on a straight up revenge motivation or a jealousy or something like that the scary thing about an expect the calls of course is that the motivations that what the characters did are much more relatable to the audience okay because there will be people sitting in that audience who have fired people for no reason and many many times there will be people who have had inappropriate relations extramarital relations etc um, and there are many many people who have used and abused their power and influence um when they shouldn't have so the whole purpose is to deny us that catharsis and that detachment that we would get in an agatha christie let's say the killer does not face justice not in the, not in the immediate sense we're left hanging with that second phone call of what's going to happen to them but again we spoke earlier about the the legal and moral ramifications of the play it is unlikely any of them will face the inside of a prison cell what they will face of course is each other and they will potentially face uh damaging of their reputation which is so important to the elder burlings but what the audience faces which is far more important is this uncomfortable truth and this uncomfortable moment that there is there isn't always somebody there who's going to tell us that what we are doing is wrong it, we have to have this sort of sense of morality with us all the time that we need to choose our thoughts and our words and our deeds much much more carefully or the world suffers in fire and blood and anguish anguish of course so he subverts that reassuring ending where we allow to detach ourselves from the villain of the piece by saying we would never do that because of course most of us have done that and the things the burlings are guilty of maybe we haven't done the exact same thing as them but we potentially have been in similar situations we've had similar experiences where we want to use our power our influence to do the wrong thing and Priestley wants us to absolutely not do that 
and that's how he spreads his socialist message.